Tell me where you were born and when you came to Canada. I was born in a, in the, in a village named Majita in the province of our state of Punjab. Um, this village is very close to um, the city of Amritsar. And when did you come to Canada? And I actually immigrated to Canada in 1970, October of 1970. Tell me about the culture shock you experienced when you arrived in Canada in regards to yourself having a lot more freedom, but at the same time seeing South Asian women so confined to traditional gender roles. Well, um, when I arrived in Canada, um, I actually experienced quite a bit of culture shock myself when I went into the Indian community and visited some of the families. I had come from an urban background in India, traveled around in Indian cities because my father was in the army and every three years we moved to a new place. Um, and when I got here and I went into people's homes, the women would very often, not always, but quite often be ushered into the kitchen and you would sit there in the kitchen with other women and the men would sit in the living room and have their ch chat separately. Whereas I was used to uh, more of a mixed atmosphere where if somebody came to our house, we all sat together, whether it was men or women, or, and we would be talking together. There was no segregation of the sexes in that sense. And a lot of my education itself was in co-ed uh, schools. So it was quite a shock in that sense. But apart from that, even the life of people here. It just seemed as if they got here and their culture was frozen to the times when they left India or if they came from a village in India, their lifestyle continued to be the same here in many ways. So uh, that was kind of startling a little bit for me. Tell me about some of the tra tragedies about uh, South Asian women being murdered and what you heard in the media around that time. Well, when I arrived, I started volunteering in the Vancouver School Board, with the Vancouver School Board in the schools here. And, um, and I was also active in the community um, because I happened to meet my husband, who later became my husband. Of, at that time, I just knew him as a friend uh, from school. And he was very active and involved in the community. Um, and um, because of our association with each other, we got to be friends. And we would very often, if he heard about events happening in the community, he'd tell me. And I'd tag along and we'd go to meetings together. Or if I was going somewhere, he would come along and, you know, just out of interest in terms of what was happening in the community. And I became quite aware of the lifestyle of women here, and more so through my volunteer work uh, in the schools. Um, the stories from the teachers and sometimes the children that I would be working with would tell stories at home of the abuse that their mothers were suffering. Um, and um, as I got more involved in the community, became aware that many of our women were leading very isolated lives. They were at home, didn't know the language, most of them. And the English classes weren't as rapidly available at that time as they have been in the more recent past. Uh, so they could not even go out and talk to their neighbors. They could, did not have very many friends. And some of the women, particularly those who came here as a result of getting married to someone. They came here, arrived here through marriage and had nobody else. Many times they didn't have any other relatives here. The only person or the family that they knew was the family that they were coming into. So if they came into a family that was um, very welcoming of them and was nice to them, it was fine. But if you came into a family that uh, did not treat her well or chose not to treat the woman well, your life could be hell. And uh, we heard a lot of stories where women weren't allowed to go out. Uh, their husbands would be afraid that if they went out too much, they'd become too independent or become too westernized. And um, they would 
be asked to stay home. Um, and as a result, their lives became very, very isolated. And sometimes, a lot of times, women would be going to depression, or if they were suffering abuse, they didn't know what to do, where to go. Um, and some of the cases resulted in extreme circumstances where women ended up committing suicide. There were a few cases of suicide. There were some cases of murder, when I look back over the years. And some of those just stuck to my head. And it sort of uh, bothered me a lot when you read stories about what was happening or when you heard stories from other people as to how, what kind of lives women were lead, leading. Tell me about the India Mahila Association and its purpose. Well, you know, as a result of some of the incidents that I've just talked about, um, I became aware and I would talk about some of these things at home. My husband, who was, um, by 1972, I was married and uh, to him, and whenever I talk about things at home, he would say, well, if something bothers you, you've got to do something about it. You can't just sit home and talk about it. So I was very fortunate to have a supportive husband because my family, where I came from, we were very, very apolitical. Politics of any sorts, particularly partisan politics, wasn't discussed at home at all. Um, and when I met him and came uh, to live with him, he actually was very, very politicized. He was always debating, discussing, and wanting to bring about change and do things. And he encouraged me to do that, do the same. Whenever I'd um, talk about something, how bad it was, he would say, well, do something to change. So that was a good inspiration for me. And some of these cases that happened around us uh, really bothered me. So I would always say, yeah, we should do something. And we then, talking to some of the friends, talking to relatives at home, we decided that we needed to have a woman, woman's organization. There were a few Indian organizations around, but most of them were uh, male-dominated. The men had the limelight. They were, they were presidents, vice presidents, and other office holders in the organizations. Women usually did a lot of the work in the background, but didn't really get credit for all of the work that they did. They would be the secretaries, they'd be organizing things, they'd be taking minutes, and the men would be out there representing the organization everywhere. So we decided that women needed an organized voice. And we started talking about it in 1972. And then by about 1973, we actually formed the organization, and then we started going into the community and saying we belong to this organization. And we could just see the, uh, you know, uh, the people kind of uh, saying, why, why do you need, some people even asked, oh, there are so many organizations, why, why do you really want another organization? Why did you need to set up a separate organization for women? And then we explained that we feel we have the right to do so and we feel that the women need an organized voice. So uh, we formed that organization and we wanted to really bring about some change and be able to help the situation in, uh, you know, for women. Um, initially, it was just to have an organized voice for women. And then we slowly started using the media that was around in those days. There used to be radio stations that would do one or two hours of um, of programming in Punjabi for the Indian community. And whenever we would hear about incidents happening, incidents of suicide or murder, which were extreme results of the abuse that the women had faced, um, we would go and we would talk about those situations on radio, on TV. Um, and um, as when we, when we did that, we got a mixed reaction. Some of the people were very anti the kind of things that we were talking about. Other people were very understanding and very supportive. Um, but when you, whenever you talked about it, you were leaving yourself out in the open and uh, you were putting yourself forward to receive criticism. 
uh, people would um, say, oh yeah, you guys are giving out too much, you're spoiling our women, you're giving them too much information, or they would say, well, we don't agree with what you were saying, you know, there's no problem in the community at all, um, things like that. And um, we continued to speak our mind. We started giving information out on the radios uh, and television programs and saying to the women, if you are facing abuse or if you need assistance, you need help, you should get out and talk about it. You don't have to hide. You don't have to commit suicide or you don't have to um, be subjected to that kind of treatment. It's not right. And we would talk to the men and also say the same thing, that you need to get out there and you need to bring about change. In fact, when we initially started the organization, we invited men to come and speak from our stages. There were two or three different men in the community that we knew were progressive and had forward-looking views. And we actually invited them to speak. And when we couldn't find anybody else, we invited our own husbands. You know, um, my husband spoke from our stage. There was another member, Herminder. Her husband came and spoke from our stages later on when they came and joined our organization. So we had men speaking out from our stages as well, talking to men and saying we have to be responsible for our actions. Because our fight wasn't the fight between men and women, you know. It was a fight to get equality and good treatment for women. But um, we felt in order to have that equality, both men and women have to bring about that change. You can't just be pitted against each other and not do it, but sometimes you have to take people to task. And if they are, their behavior needs changing, then you have to advocate that, and they have to accept that they have to change that behavior. Thank you. What are some of your proudest accomplishments uh, that you achieved through the India Mahila Association? Well, that's a tough question to answer. Um, I think one, the very first thing that we embarked on was the area of prevention. Because when India Mahila started in 1973, there were very few services for immigrant women in particular. Whatever advocacy services that were available at that time were mainstream, uh, they had mainstream staff, they had very few women from immigrant communities who could speak their language, who understood their culture. And um, even the shelters, like we started, as I said, talking in 72, and we actually formed the organization, established it in 1973. Even the first shelter, I think, here in Vancouver was opened in, if I'm not mistaken, I think 74. Uh, it could be 73, but I think it was 74. So the, we were right there organizing and mobilizing the women in our community when the larger women's movement was uh, out there organizing and mobilizing. And I was involved both in my own community and also like as Vancouver status of women was being established, I remember going to some of the meetings over there. And um, so some of us who were had one foot in the larger community and the other foot in, the, in our own community were, became that link, link over there. And what we did at that time was to bridge that gap that was there. For example, when we went out into the community and talked about the shelters, told the women, if you need help, this is where you can go. You can call this number. You can go there. You'll have a safe place to stay. And uh, when they actually phoned and went there, sometimes a day later or two days later, they'd be scared and they'd want to leave the place and go back to their home, to the same abusive environment, because they didn't feel comfortable in the shelters. They didn't have food that they could eat. They didn't understand the language. And um, culturally, there were some problems there. So very quickly, what we did, we made links with the shelters, the couple of shelters that were here, uh, the rape relief, uh, women's shelter is still around and we made links with them. 
we said, you know, this is the problem we are facing. This woman came to you, but this, these are her experiences, and maybe we can together work to see how we can eradicate those problems so that women are feel more comfortable when they come to you and that you feel a lot um, more comfortable serving them. So what we did was we told them what kind of food they eat, what could they do, if they could have a few lentils, have some vegetables, maybe encourage them to do some cooking over there of their own choice and they'll be comfortable. And then we made ourselves available to them that if they needed interpretation. Sometimes we'd, I'd be out attending a party in somebody's house and 11 o'clock at night I would get a call from my house. It didn't have cell phones in those days and my son would be call, uh, call, calling me or a relative that was with me would be calling me saying there's this phone call they want to talk to you right now and it would be a call from a shelter and uh, they they had a woman there but they couldn't communicate very well so I would do the interpretation on the phone and same way other members of our organization there were three four of us that gave our phone lines out to the shelters so that we could help so that was the very first accomplishment where we bridged that gap and made our services available and India Mahila Association has always been a totally volunteer organization. We have had no operational funding from any source of government for the last 42 years that we have been around. Ever since 1973, never had an operational funding. We are all totally volunteers, women who want to bring about change, who are dedicated to, to that cause and are there because they want to do it. Um, and what I, what I found was that was the first one. And then after that, as we went out, because the few organizations that were there were doing Band-Aid work. They would, like the shelters would get the women after the incidents had happened, after the woman had already faced the abuse. And, um, but we felt that you needed some prevention work. You wanted to talk about it before the incidents happened. You want to change the mindset. So we started talking to the media in the community and we would ask them for time so we can come out and talk about the issues. And most of the people were receptive, particularly there's um, Sushma Dutt who has her own radio station now. In those days she was doing segments on TV and um, radio and she welcomed us. There were a couple of other people who welcomed us on their stations and we would go and we would talk and give out the information to the women. What happened as a result of that? Women heard us talking about these issues. They came to know how, what views we had and how we could help them. So they started, we started receiving calls from them at home because the community was much smaller. You could talk to somebody, they would phone the radio station, ask them for our number, and then the radio station would ask us, can we give out your number? And I would say, okay, you can do that. So when those women came out, they, they called us, we would have to provide them some sort of support, some sort of referral. So that was the next thing that came as a result of our talking out in the community women became aware of our presence, our views, and started calling us for assistance when they were in trouble. And we had, didn't really have any resources to help them out other than just our volunteer time. So what we would do is we would look out for the resources in the community. If they needed a safe place, we'd direct them to the shelter. If they needed some counseling, we'd direct them to an organization that needed that could provide that service to them. And um, in the beginning, we sometimes kept some of the women in our house, but we very quickly found out that was dangerous. You don't do that. And then we just made the links with the shelters and always started directing them there. So we did that. I think over the years, we brought about some change in the thinking of people. I were very aware that we also are labeled. People call us homebreakers and they call us troublemakers because they think by providing information to the women in the community, we are, we are spoiling them and uh, we're breaking the homes. You know, They don't realize that in order to have a strong family, you need both partners to be strong. If you want to have a good 
secure environment at home. If you set a good example and role model for your children, your children will learn from that. And, they do. and if they see abuse and fights and all of that at home, that's what they're going to do when they grow up. So I always say you have a strong family and you'll have a strong community. You have a strong community, you have a strong society, and it goes on. So, you know, those kinds of changes where some of the paid organizations wouldn't dare to speak out too much because they were afraid of losing their funding. And we had no funding, so we weren't afraid of that and we could speak our mind. And um, as a result, you know, we spoke out, we made some enemies and we made some friends, both. The other achievement um, over the years, um, apart from the general changing of the mindset, um, in the early 90s, we came across uh, a doctor south of the border who was advertising in the South Asian community newspapers, full page ads talking about sex selection, which is, and he would advertise and he would say, um, learn the sex of your fetus as early as eight weeks. First he started saying 12 weeks and then he started saying eight weeks and you know, even earlier at times. And he would say, um, ab and, and, and underneath the sentence he would have abortion information available. So what he was doing was he was trying to target the South Asian community in terms of he thought they have a preference for male bo uh, boys, you know, for male offsprings rather than having females so he could make some money out of that and um, he was advertising trying to sell his practice I think he still has a has a, a clinic out in Blaine and um, he used to charge five hundred dollars at per person at that time and now I think it's more than doubled but he made his money that way so we actually organized first we phoned the newspapers and said we would like you to uh, to remove these ads from your newspapers because they are um, they are uh, promoting sexism, they are uh, promoting the female feticide and we are against it and we request you to take the ads. Of course the newspapers didn't want to remove the ads because they were also making money from those ads. So we ran into roadblocks there and um, when they didn't listen we had to take other steps. We what we did was we contacted the politicians and whenever an election came around and that happened once there was a federal election and a provincial election close together and we contacted all political parties and we said um, um, we don't want you to place ads in these papers because they carry ads that promote sexism, that promote female feticide, that uh, goes against our principles of equality and we actually succeeded to a great extent because majority of the political, in fact the, all of the political parties gave us responses and said they wouldn't although there were individual members who still continued to place ads there but the newspapers lost a lot of their um, ads because of our campaign and eventually they removed the ads from that but we faced a lot of criticism and front page stories on the newspaper accusing us of various things as well at that time. Yeah. So that was another achievement. This doctor wanted to open a clinic in Vancouver and we organized a demonstration against him when he came to speak. Uh, that had an impact as well. There was a commission on reproductive technologies um, that was sitting where he came to speak and we, ha we were marching outside and of course uh, we were delighted at the end that the, um, the ruling was in our favor and he wasn't um, encouraged or allowed to open his clinic in Vancouver which he wanted to do. Um, so you know there's been different things over time but what we've been able to do in a lot of cases is just to provide that informal support to a woman who may be in need, who may be in distress, who has nowhere else to turn to, just having a shoulder to cry on or to get a little support from sometimes make a, makes a whole lot of difference in your lives. And that's the role that we've been able to play. 
we've remained totally apolitical uh, in, in the sense that we don't do, as an organization, we don't participate in partisan politics. We don't support one political party over other. We look at the issues and what the parties stand for and will support or not support a particular party based on the issues that they stand for. Um, but otherwise, we don't let that, let that interfere with our organization, the partisan politics. We have remained secular. We do not take stands on the issue of uh, religion and get involved with the religious divisions. And we welcome everybody, regardless of their religion, regardless of what political party they belong to, as long as they are committed to the issues and the ideology that we stand for, which is proper dignity, respect for women and their status, you know, in society. Thank you. Mm. What were some of the obstacles you faced both within your community and outside of the South Asian community? Well, within the community, uh, as I said, we were labeled. Uh, so that was one of the obstacles. Sometimes there were some people who didn't, you know, if, you, if they got to know you, they were afraid of their wives getting too close to you because they thought they'd be spoiled if you hung around with them. And um, you knew, you could tell very quickly, you know, they would come out and they would talk to you, but usually didn't want them to be talking to you. I've so often heard from women when I meet various women in the community or sometimes when we're helping some of the women and they tell us stories, they'll say, whenever you came on television or whenever we heard you on the radio, like my family would say, oh, go in, go in and do your work now. Turn the TV off. You know, this is nonsense. These people are only there to break homes. So it's that kind of a reputation that you get yourself into sometimes because of your stand. But then the thing is, if you stand for something, you're going to make enemies. If you stand for nothing, you're not going to have any enemies. But then you're doing nothing. So if you do something, you're bound to have some friends and some enemies. Uh, so those are the kinds of obstacles we, we faced. And sometimes people would accuse us of creating trouble in the community, um, you know. Um, but fortunately, because we had those of us who had support at home and encouragement to continue the work that we were doing, um, it was a very big help there. Yeah, in the mainstream community, there was, you asked me about the obstacles in the mainstream community. One of the problems that we've run into uh, over time is that when you speak about some of the inequities and the circumstance, disturbing circumstances, the murders, the suicides, Sometimes what happens is there is this danger where the mainstream community, people there, look at you and then they generalize everything and everything gets stereotyped. So when you speak, you have to be very, very careful. Sometimes when you're talking, what you're saying, even you're fighting the inequities in, the, in your own community and you are talking outside in the larger community, they can be misinterpreted in the sense that they think the whole community is like that and the whole community becomes painted with the same brush. And that is a danger. So you, in your own community, you're fighting the inequities that exist in various communities around the world. But at the same time, then you go out and you're trying to defend your community and say, well, the whole community is not like that. There's only certain sections, just like any other community. You read history and literature in the European world, the Western world, and how women were treated and bought and sold and what uh, stuff they suffered, you would find that there was, there's been a lot of inequity. You go to the shelters and you will see that it's not only South Asian women. There's women from all kinds of backgrounds that come to the shelters. So we that are working in the field know that this is a universal problem everywhere. But those are the kinds of, you have to be careful when you're talking and what you're saying. So that sometimes got to be frustrating, trying to defend you, having to defend your community, you know, 
out in the public in the mainstream movement whereas of course you don't want to be defending the um, behavior that is absolutely deplorable but then it's not the whole community it's those people who are committing those crimes that need to be taken to task. In the last 42 years, what differences, if any, have you seen in the community in terms of the status of women? Well, I, I think there's been quite a bit of change. You, when I first came out here, you could count on your fingertips how many lawyers there were, how many uh, doctors there were in the community from our South Asian background, for example. Now, when you go out, you see a lot of doctors, lawyers, and other professions, engineers, whatever it may be, whether it's workers, union leaders. But in the good old days when we came out, you didn't see as many people. People, young children growing up didn't have enough role models. Even teachers in the school system, there were a few, but very few, far too few. To you know, compared to the number of um, number of uh, numbers in the community, so that change has happened. We're seeing more and more South Asians in different fields. We're seeing um, we, we're not seeing as many suicides by the youth in terms of uh, committing suicide because their parents are not allowing them to meet marry according to their choice. We are seeing that a um, lot more young women are entering school, universities, and um, studying. You know, uh, they're not being forced into marriage right after high school. Not that it's not happening. It's still happening to some extent. But there are those changes that we see. There is a lot more dialogue and debate in the community on some of these issues. Um, there's a lot more acceptance of the fact that, yes, things need to change. Um, unfortunately, it's been at a very high cost whenever the community has been rocked with murders or, you know, um, we wake up and say, oh, yeah, we've got to do something. Um, but there has been a lot more discussion, a lot more change, and women are beginning. You see a lot more women coming out and speaking about it because they hear others speaking out and a lot more women leaving abusive situations. Not that I'm not promoting leaving the house, but what I, sometimes it becomes necessary. When you, I would not encourage anybody to just break up the family for something small that where you can talk about it, where you can, I always, whenever I'm working with a woman, I'd say, is there any hope? Is there anybody that can sit you guys down and talk about it? Have you tried that? You know, you try and first of all exhaust all um, ways of keeping the family together if you can. But if you are going to keep the family together and just be fighting every single day and, you know, abusing your partner, that's not going to set a very nice role model for, for the children. So I do see change, but we've still got a long ways to go. Yeah, yeah, we're not there yet. Thank you. Um, that concludes the interview. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we finish up? No, the only thing I would say is that I'd really like to encourage some young women to be, be more involved. Um, People like me and my age group were there almost close to retirement. And I want to see some young blood coming out, becoming more aware of the issues. I know that we've got some youth in the community who are involved in various fundraisers, doing different things on issues, and that's wonderful to see. But particularly, even on the status of women, I mean, there's many different organizations that are working towards this, which is a joy to see different organizations crop up and work towards that cause. But I really would urge anybody that, you know, can, should get involved and extend 
uh, hand. You know, join an organization, get out there on your own, and do things to bring about change. I think each one of us can bring about that change if we try, because every little action comes together and becomes a force if you come together. So that's all I will say. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right.